Okay, great. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming both online and, and here in person. So today we welcome Kevin Yablonka to our final AI for Science seminar of the year. Uh, so Kevin uh, leads a research group at the newly established Kevin Holtz Institute for Polymers and Energy Applications um, of the University of Vienna and the Helmholtz Center in Berlin. So he uses computational tools and machine learning to try and capture the tacit dimension of chemistry and is an active contributor to the ChemInfo Electronic Lab Notebook ecosystem and other open source projects, uh, which you can find on his GitHub page. So he's very passionate about the digitization of chemistry. Kevin obtained his bachelor's in chemistry at TU Munich and his master's and PhD from EPFL. Um, so we're very happy to have him here today uh, visiting Chalmers and we look forward to what he has to say about uh, uh, how machine learning can help us find a new material but not a needle in a haystack. So the floor is yours, Kevin. Thank you. Let me try to share my screen. So, I mean, I guess the title is kind of strange um, for talking our domain. That was become clear. Because in the end, uh, many of us um, care about um, finding a new material. And um, and the reason for this is because quite often materials are the key bottleneck for making um, something work, some innovation possible. And when we think about the process of finding a new compound, we often compare it to finding a needle in the haystack. Of course, in our case, a needle is the optimum compound in the space of all the possible ones. And over time, people went into haystacks looking for needles, uh, but no one, at least in Manoj, has been using ML um, to help them do so. So the question is, um, why do I, why do we think that it's possible to use ML to help us in the search uh, when all those folks went, in, went into haystacks didn't use ML? And even though this might sound silly as a question and not that constructive, I think that going through this can really help us illustrate some of the key challenges in this process, but also come up with some of the key advantages and promises um, of doing this. And so I want to um, think about contrasting those two ways of searching. And if you have needles, of course, but simply you have one objective. And once you have it, you're done and you're happy. If you look for a new compound, you have many objectives. And you want to have a good conversion, good selectivity. It should be cheap, scalable, efficient, probably also even safe. And then you no longer have a nice line to rank components along. You have no longer one nice absolute ranking. But the best you can have without any weights on different objectives is that they have this Pareto frontier here where you have two objectives or more. And you can say that some of them here dominate the other ones, but you can really like rank them in one nice line. This, of course, makes search way harder. But it gets even worse because we are spoiled for choice in chemistry. Um, we have too many options, and we have them also in there and go through scales. So if we have the perfect atomic scale um, with the perfect active side, the perfect binding energy I put into a zeolite, and we have no mass transport, nothing will happen. So we have to look across different scales also make something that works in practice. And then we have to just, I mean, there are different estimates and this big number is just big, but in any case, we have just too many options to go through. So here, look at how many ways you have to fill this box here with atoms. And then there are more ways than you have atoms in the universe. I mean, just in any case, just brute forcing this um, won't work. And so why do we have no hope that this can work for us? And the reason is that we don't live in a haystack, because if we were in a haystack, going through it randomly is the best we can do, because there's no structure to learn from. Um, we, if we learn nothing on our path through this haystack, but, but if we have material space, we can go through it and build maps of the space and with more and more data, build better and better maps, and let those maps guide us through the space and then inform us where the most interesting parts of the space are. And then we can use those methods navigation system across chemical space. And of course, now models can help us to map the coordinates in the space to performance uh, of different parts of the space. So you're gonna build now models, but models can do a lot of things and often quite bad things. And they can do almost um, too much quite often, and, and so we can learn basically all functions with most models. But we're going to learn the right ones, which are only a small part of all functions. What do we do now in chemistry? We can, I don't know, just be in Google and have a lot of data and just throw all of this in. And this way constrain what we learn. But quite often in our domains, we have quite little of data to throw in there. So we have to be more clever in there. 
So we have to also add all we know about physics and chemistry and like devices to help us here um, in the search. And so my talk will about using um, both ellipses here somehow more effectively in our search. We need to have tools for this to make this possible. So we have to build tools across the time to have more data in usable form it goes to your lens databases uh, for different structures, then how we can map structures to vectors to learn from them. So how we convert this thing with different number of atoms, different types of atoms to a fixed um, length vector of some form, how to compare models and then how to use them to guide us um, through space. And we have been doing this um, for different tasks across scales from the atom scale, oxidation states across then perhaps the mesoscale, um, for diffusion and polymers, and to even in the plant scale, we look at emissions of amines from pilot plants for carbon capture. And in all those cases, um, we have no theory to help us here. So if you look at this plant here, um, there's actually nothing as we can do other than just say a ribbon because there's no theory that tells us how the emissions will change and change the operation of the plant. And I want to do this um, looking at how we use ML here in two different ways. Um, one of them is perhaps the classical way of using ML in chemistry to use hard inductive biases and by feature vectors, and then um, perhaps a more fashionable nowadays way uh, with soft inductive biases um, using our lens. And before we start the search, um, I want to go back to this compass theme to really see how this, well, this can bring us um, this data-driven um, um, theme both as guidance systems for chemical space. And this is with BISF, and they make polymers amongst others, and they make them for this person to keep colors bright in, in car paint, let's say. They have different customers and they all have different objectives, but they can make many different polymers at BISF. So you have in their case, this zoo of different polymers here, and they wanna know what's actually interesting in my stack of polymers I could, I could make. So what should I focus on? which might be interesting for some customer in, in my company or in my, my customer base, and which are those I can just throw away and never focus on again. So we're gonna classify somehow efficiently, but also not missing the best polymer out there, which ones are the most interesting ones to look at, and which ones I can just throw away because it will never be interesting for anyone in the space. And so we have now for our case, um, three objectives. So we should stick to a surface, repel other polymers, and again, be not too viscous to be easy to use. And testing this in lab is way too expensive, so we then use simulations. We have workflows for those things with umbrella sampling and then coarse grain simulations. We measure how well they stick, how they repel, and how long they are. And um, then we still have this big playground. And so in the end, even with simulations, take a week or so per polymer, it's still too much to go through um, just by brute forcing it. So you might say, how would you address this? We can just replace perhaps Molson with something cheaper. Cheaper might be for you the model. So you flip out this function here that maps polymers to numbers with Molson with something cheaper with the model. Um, but how do you now build this model to be in the end efficient, but also confident in the right parts of the chemical space? And I think we have there two ways of doing this. One of them is we can just train all data which is perhaps the most naive thing. We just trained all the polymers. We didn't have the perfect model, but in the end, we didn't win anything because we trained and still all the polymers in there. If we train on some, it's of course way more efficient, but also mean you can trust this model in the end. So we would like to have a feedback loop between the model and what to next do, as we would like the model to tell us what the next best polymer to look at would be. But the challenge is now we have those different objectives in here. So how do you combine those things and telling us what the next best thing to do is? And this is quite tricky because quite often people just add up different objectives like here. So just have like a linear sum objectives. And if you have a nice objective space, you find for different weights, different points here on the surface of solutions. But if you have a real world case and something non-convex, you add um, with different weights those points up, but you never find anything here in this non-convex area. And this is just one reason why searching with different objectives is quite hard to do, because you don't know a priori if your surface of solutions um, will be non-convex in some part, and if you can just go about adding those objectives up in this way. So what do we do instead? Um, and the reason um, and the solution here is actually quite simple. So here we just have um, two objectives. We can 
go of course to a more here. We want to maximize now for our case. And we have now in this case, each point here being a polymer. And we put here as points the mean uh, prediction for both um, objectives in here. And then we have something like a GPR giving us uncertainties uh, for our predictions. So we add them also to this image and we can then scale them um, to be uh, rectangles. So we have here then the upper bounds being the best case scenario where we have the best predict best estimate for both the highest estimate for both objectives here on, on the upper corner here. And the worst case, the lowest prediction for both objectives would be then um, the lower corner here. And so we can directly by just looking at the image see it for certain points here, we have the best case being below the worst case of some other ones within those rectangles. So we know for sure that certain parts in here, we can just throw away. And we have some others, we know for sure that they're um, the worst cases above the best case of other ones, so we can keep them for sure. And then the best thing to do is we can just reduce uncertainties in this part here, sample again, and then we end if we have all points in the space classified as either being good or bad. And then we can of course tune how much we scale those and you can even derive like bounds on how fast you can go through space with a certain uh, accuracy in the end for your solution. And you can basically tune the scaling factor and benchmark this in different ways. Here we have as, as a baseline and um, just brute force random search. And you can now add this approach in different ways. And, and of course go way faster here. This is log scale um, to find a comparable solution. You can even then use different tricks with GPRs to use different objectives and then indeed also missing data if you have different costs for different objectives in here. And, and therefore this approach has now been used across the board for different things uh, from catalysis like chemistry uh, to even process engineering where you also have to optimize for different objectives in here. So we now know how to search with models um, through chemical space, but how do we build those models go in this search? And with this, I want to go to the atom scale to something quite fuzzy, but that's still important for chemists is the oxidation state. And this comes back because when I run DFT simulations for MOFs, uh, and then we notice that we need to have some gas for electron counts um, for simulations. And, and for those, we need to have oxidation states. And, and chemists use them all the time, even the names of the compounds, but there's actually no theory behind them. There's no observable um, theory in quantum mechanics for oxidation states. And, and so, the best we have goes back to Pauling, and he has a rule where you count the exponential of the bond length across the coordination environment and then add them up, and then have what you call bond valence sum. And if you do this for copper, you see that you get an accuracy um, for MOFs that's shown here, 85%. And if you just always say copper two, you are not that much worse than having this rule from Pauling. And if you are a chemist, as I am, this is quite surprising to you because as chemists, you have really good intuition about what the oxidation state should be for a given environment. So why is Pauling's rule um, so much worse than chemist intuition in this case here? And how can we improve upon this? And, and so to do this, we have to basically incorporate some of this intuition we have as chemists into a modeling and use five features in this case here. So we use locality approximation as the key building principle of our model. We focus on local environments in here like on one copper side uh, in this MOF in this case. And then have a vector describing what the metal here would be, where it is in the pair table, what the environment is as chemistry point of view, like what neighbor atoms are, and also importantly, what the shape of this environment is, like how square, planar, tetrahedral, and so on in this environment is. And then we have for each environment a vector of 100 numbers or so, go to a CSD that we have in the names of the compounds, the oxidation states, they might come from intuition, they might come from XPS, something else. We just take all of them and then featureize our environments. And as chemists have all the ways of reasoning, we also have an ensemble of models where we also have different ways of reasoning models and let the models vote. And then we just take the majority vote here and have our prediction in this case. And there's all here open source in here in our tool stack. Um, but the important question to ask now is, does it actually work and, and is it actually useful for anyone? So here we have a measure of how well we do in, in confusion matrices. So we have here how often we get the right oxidation states over here. We have how often we find one when actually there is one uh, across the board. We do, I think, quite okay-ish. But if you now add this uncertainty measure in here, look at the way all models say the same thing, 
and we do even better. I mean, if we go back to polling, we again have different ways of telling how good we do. Always um, zero here is the worst, one is the best. And we also do now a uh, way better than polling, but then here's some other classification based lines. But the most interesting thing is what happens if our model is confident, but still apparently wrong, disagreeing with the CSD, for instance, the database. And then we fill page after page after page in the SI uh, with typos we find in the CSD. Because quite often chemists just flip the Roman 4 with Roman 6, and the model still gets this right and then can help us spot mistakes and data because you can use the model to basically uh, flag those mistakes or even it's not being used or the CSD to help them find mistakes in the data. So really see that how models can also be a psychic assistant for chemists, like a co-pilot to help them um, be more productive and hopefully also get their data out of the, end, out of the, of the, of the work in the end. And the data is in the end um, somehow all our dream to have more and cleaner data, um, but usually uh, we don't have it. And the part of my work has also been to hopefully change this a bit to, to make more use of data we have, get more data uh, for modeling. And with this, we have been building our tools around this uh, with the ultimate goal to have something what we also have for recipes in the kitchen. So if I now um, go home this weekend, I'm gonna have a breakfast with my wife, I might look on Google for pancake recipes, and then I get uh, here in the results a nice table of recipes that come from different blog posts, different websites, where I have all the ingredients here, all the all the ratings in the same form. So you have different websites appearing in the same table and um, all in the same structure. And in the end, we also cook a lot of stuff in, in, in chemistry in a lab. So why don't we have this um, also for chemistry? And we have this uh, for the kitchen because in the websites we have the data in some structured form with links to some vocabulary. So here we have certain keys being used for certain pieces. And so Google knows where to look for certain information in here and can look for different recipes like um, like Baron's um, kitchen and um, like Baron's pancake recipes. Um, so if you would have this, of course, for MOFs, we could then, of course, um, anticipate that we might go somewhere like here. We can like have more meaningful search for chemical recipes. But if you try to do this, you see that data we have right now is just a big mess. So we wanted to build at some point a model for colors of, of compounds. We looked for data for colors. And we found this here. We find in a text of papers and database, different names, different color strings, describing that a certain color change or compound is pale yellow or is blue. And we then try to model this, um, this data, predict like given the structure, what the color should be. And this didn't uh, work at all. And so we asked ourselves, why doesn't this uh, work? And so we just asked them at some point um, people at EPFL to pick what they see for a given color string. So we built this a small app here. They can just get random color names people use for the color of their compounds. And we just ask people to pick what they see for a given color string. And you see what here what happened and um, some of those extreme results, you might see something that you call um, amber, you might see um, this here, but someone else says, I made your compound, it's also amber for me, but actually they have something that looks like this. So we see how just the data reporting um, standards we have right now limit what you can achieve um, with our tools. And so our focus has been on basically improving this and um, using different novel ways of getting data from the lab with low effort from the chemists, so in this case, we have, this is the reason I'm showing this because really uh, illustrative. We now just have a chatbot on a phone and a WhatsApp bot. You can take a color uh, image of your, of your compound here, a collaboration card, then send this to your um, lab notebook via chat. Then we have some tools to calibrate the color of this image. You can then have a number, of course, now for your color or even numbers, distribution of numbers because you have a sample now of different colors in here. And then have all of this and digital structured form in a database. And then you can even, if you still want to have a name for treating about it, but in the end you have everything importantly, initial form in your ELM. And then you can do powerful things. You can just um, with different data sources, if you have different measurement instruments, put them all together in one interface. You can load all of them on the fly in your browser. 
interact with them, the data is still alive there, can apply processing directly in the browser from different instruments, and then even do simple stuff and like clustering PCA directly on the fly, even if you're a, a bench chemist that doesn't usually use um, those tools. And this is something we then even pushed um, to getting USIs with one click. So if you have the data in the seal, then you can put with one click everything on Zenodo and have was there the data still being alive and usable for other chemists. And all, everything also for us via REST API for use in modeling and later on. And if you also teach, um, or if you do something where you need to have a reference, you often want to compare simulations with experiments. So if you think about um, porous compounds, you would like to see how large the pores for the ideal crystal. So you often have to talk to a computational chemist, give you this reference, but this is quite routine for them and they are kind of bored by doing this all the time. But you need to have this as a reference. And so we just add now in our lab notebook, you can with one click, transform your SIF party structure from XLB and to simulation platform. And there we have robust workflows, like for isotherms, for DFT optimization. You can select one of those workflows. We have good default settings. And then you can, with a few clicks, uh, run the simulation. And then after, even if you know what to do, you can even still customize, but often you can just take, take defaults. And then you have, after some time, in your lab notebook, as you would have all your measurements in there, um, the simulation and data. So you can have the full provenance of all simulation and experiment results in the same notebook, and you can really have routine simulations being routinely done by bench chemists as well. And if you now use those tools, you can even then go to use them in teaching. For instance, if you have now something where you teach IR spectroscopy, you can give students a really a place to explore chemistry in a much richer way. So here we have just been using those tools I have been just showing you from this ELN and have been putting them into a teaching tool. And so people can now just in this tool um, draw different structures and directly have interactive way to explore how different chemistries impact the IR spectrum, for instance, or the Raman spectrum. So you can explore um, inverse symmetry effects, um, mesomeric inductive effects, and so on. And everything here is linked into active. So you can click on a bond on, or a mode and then see like which vibration corresponds to which part, and really then just explore more broadly and go away from those tables you often have in chemistry uh, undergrad. Um, and, and so um, I think this can really help us to, to move away into, uh, into a more usable way uh, of data and chemistry. But even there, the most that we have in there is still in the form of text. So, so quite often we have in the lab notebooks, the most favorite field here is a text field, or we have data in journals or textbooks. And there's a good reason that this is this, this way, because quite often the data is quite depending on the context in which you create data. So if you have a reaction, you care about the order of addition, and there might be a new field for this in your schema of your database. So there might be a column in your table for this. And text is then just the most flexible way of recalling this in your lab notebook. And so how do we now use um, this text more effectively. And our first approach was perhaps um, quite naive to think just about every prediction we do as text completion. So here we have a table of different alloys and we want to know under certain conditions if we will form one phase or multiple phases for a given alloy. So we want to classify composition um, to a given alloy, uh, to a given phase um, if you have one multiple phases. And then what we do is we just transform this table into questions and answers. So in this case, we ask, what's the phase of this composition? And the answer would be then a single multiple phase. And then the only trick here is to take a, a big um, LM and we just then fine tune, we update the weights of the model, make it better at answering those questions. We better at answering a question like this with the right composition. So here we just flip the text to numbers to make it easier for the model. And then we have a new model with new weights and can then ask new questions about um, this chemistry. And this works surprisingly well. This is shown here as one case. So we have here, again, those alloys. We have your different lines uh, in this plot. So we have a learning curve. We start with, uh, with 10 points and go to 200. And we have accuracy. It makes sense because it's a balanced classification case. We have here in dashed line 
domain experts where they have really built by hand um, some rules um, and, and some models that really fine-tuned here. We have um, in, in yellow, um, yellowish, uh, a model from Chaos Sparks Group in Utah where they have the transform optimized for compositions. And we have then in green AutoML from the Berkeley lab. And we then have in blue, our model is just fine-tuned um, on those compositions. And we beat with just 50 points um, this domain expert model trained on thousands of points. We found this across the board for different um, applications, for different domains, molecules, crystals, and even reactions. If we do regression, classification, or inverse design, it was quite often um, surprisingly good, this approach, perhaps even too good than you would expect. And if we go back to, to my PhDs, if you look at polymers, um, that I just showed you before, um, we have here um, in, in, in green, the model I've been building my PhD. And in there, uh, then we also have the model where we just fine tune the sequence of monomers you have in your polymer. You probably have saved quite some time on PhD by just directly using the polymer sequence and then train this LM on this. If you go back to oxidation states, it's the same picture here. Uh, we have in, in horizontal lines, the base lines um, tuned uh, with tens of thousands of points here in this paper in local environments. And we go back um, to, to using just the LM fine tuning and we come quite close. Um, this perhaps tells you more about the baselines and about the model here. Um, but in the end, you see that you can be way more efficient at least getting some model out of this, which I think is really a promising way to at least give um, everyone some way of doing some first modeling um, with data. You might say all of this just hallucinates in the end. You cannot trust those LMs, but in the end, you don't have to trust them because you can give access to them to tools. So here we have an approach where we have the LM having access to a bunch of different tools from the lab notebook, and like RDKit, like their bases, like simulation tools. And then we can just let the model figure out what tools to use in what order, and then have still the full way of reason the model went through and to obtain a certain result. So if we now have another question here about aspirin, we will have, have to first look at what aspirin is, at our smiles, put it into our kit, get an answer, and then compare this for us. And we will have the full chain of inputs and outputs and tool calls in there, and we really know why the model gave, gave us this answer. So we really don't have to trust those models, but can use them with robust and tested tools in there. And I think this hybrid approach is something that can really help us um, moving forward. So here we have a case where we look at polymer cell assembly and our partners want to use, uh, want to know if you form spheres, if you form worms or something else for a given polymer, if you make them. So you cell assemble those polymers into different shapes. And the common way to know what you have is to make images like this with cryotin. And this takes a lot of time, like, perhaps a day or so for each image here for each polymer. And the best thing they have to make this faster is that they have some measurement like light scattering that can like approximate what you might see then in the um, cryotem image. And so they have some rules of thumb telling them how to correlate the DLS scattering measurement to the cryotem image, like if they will form spheres, worms or something else given a given DLS. And this gives them something that gives them this performance here, uh, which still has a quite high error rate here, like how one third here they will get with the real thumb and will be incorrect. We can then with like the data they have here, which is quite limited, only a handful of points, build also an, uh, a model just based on data. And, and this is better than what they had with rules of thumb, but it's still um, quite limited. But if you combine those two things, the rules of thumb of chemists, and the data, we have the best uh, approach. We can combine, especially in LMs, those fuzzy rules where you just say, if something is low or high without the threshold, you can just say the word without having a really ex exact threshold, have then a quite good performance, even in no data regimes. And this is something we're now pushing uh, more and more moving forward. And for this, we also am um, trying to then build new models because we think in the end that you can have one approach for different tasks with those LMs, you can incorporate a lot of context in the text prompt of those models, you can incorporate a lot of fuzziness in there. And this way really give access to a lot of chemists, even bench chemists, 
um, to those tools. And with this, we are now building usability AI, um, a big model, and with 1.4 trillion text tokens um, on chemistry. And we have been building over the last months uh, big data sets from different sources, and um, like just plain tables collecting molecules or crystals to performance, um, to knowledge graphs, where you have walks across graphs to get us text prompts, to even just doing stuff based on smiles, or of course, also papers like the archives or other open source papers. And then we have built a full um, language just for sampling and then prompts like um, interaction between user and assistants about chemistry. We have different ways of sampling from tables or uh, knowledge graphs. Of course, have a way to just um, based on smart get features and prompts. We have a new full engine around um, doing just this. And we are now trying to build a uh, approach to also test those models through limits. We also get some questions that go beyond just correlating a string like smart performance, but that really goes beyond and that also goes into like reasoning and performance. And we also now get a human baseline to really see how models compare um, to humans in different tasks in chemistry. And, and so we now have our tools in place for different applications um, from MOFs and over to plants that I didn't show you. Um, and we have been using them across scales, but we haven't had so far a link across scales. So there's currently no link for us between like the atom scale or the plant scale. And so I think a, a big promise of modeling we also try to push into is to have all the links between scales that are ideally also differentiable, um, which we can of course do nowadays with Autodiv. A lot of the work ha here has been um, built uh, with a group of Baron Smith at EPFL, uh, providers across the globe. And now I have my own small team uh, in, in Germany with the first PhD students. If someone wants to join, I'm still, I'm still hiring on all levels. And I really hope it can together uh, as community, but also with our agents, and um, push forward to developing new compounds uh, for a better future for all of us. Do we have any questions in the room? Okay. okay. I see there's something in the chat. Yeah, I have a question. You said at the beginning that you kind of wanted to kind of constrain the, the search space or the, the, the new options that you got the question about. But I feel like the, the last results showing that you basically just put the slicing or some linear string into the end. Or better than most the main specific tools kind of I don't think so. I mean, like it's not really that LMs have no adaptive bias. Like there was a, a nice peer from Andrew Gordon Wilson at NYU that if you just use a transformer without any training, you have a bias to certain kind of sequences or simple sequences, which are often the true sequences. So there's a Directly, you actually just some bias to certain kinds of sequences, like real world sequences. And then, uh, what I think you shouldn't discuss is that you also put a lot of stuff in, in the pre trained model. So, you have a lot of information abstractions already built in if you do pre training. So, if I know pre trained chemistry, the model hopefully learns about functional groups, what certain fragments are correlated with certain tasks. And this is something that can reuse in downstream applications. I guess like general GPT, yeah, that's what that's what it's everything, right? It's, it's not really chemistry specific. Yeah, I mean, but this is really building now chemistry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because I mean, like right now, it's also kind of crap for chemistry. Um, GPT, I mean, GPT four is um actually something that's quite impressive, but at least GPT three point five, that's kind of random in chemistry doesn't know smiles that well, also kind of a tokenizer perhaps. Um, but I think if you train on enough broad data, it will have to pick up some basic instructions of chemistry and build up the downstream tasks. Mm -hmm. So if you only start with 10 points, like as you often have in a lab setting, you only have 10 points and having some selling points but no selling point at all. Yeah, so a bit towards your inspirational goals, towards bridging the scales. Maybe you can comment a little bit on what your plans are there. I mean, there's a lot of sort of marginalization going on right behind the, the scenes when you're when you're when you're making these leaps. So 
or do you think that this can be, do you have any sort of big ideas or clear ideas on what to do or anything to share with you? Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, I think there are two parts to bridging those scales. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we can go about this um, in, in either the approach worked for ML so far, like end to end. So if you look at what work vision, we went basically moving away all the models, which just have one big model that does everything end to end. And you might think of doing the same for our domain. That means modeling end to end reactions like what you do in lab to performance and skip like all the intermediate layers and mesoscale skill with like the 4G or your crystal lights or something like this. It's just a like, model end to end. Perhaps mm -hmm. even end to end to like what recipe you would like to do to get the performance. Um, or if you want to understand what's happening, you might want to have action resolution to really see something like a movie of an MV simulation. I don't think there, at least what we are thinking about this um, adaptive um, course training, um, direction of what diff pool and so on have been doing they basically learn how to cost train giving has to also called independent the task that you look at and uh, so you'd like to to have something that quite effectively like meta learning like um, um can adjust the costing level to to the right one because all in the end if you think about then giving chemist feedback um if you train a model for catalysis you have diffusion and binary as, as objectives for the two different things, different adaptations, uh, levels, the different scales would be important for chemists. One of them would like to look at a pores scale, the topology of the pores, and the other one would perhaps be more on the atom scale. And therefore, you would like to also, if you explain a model later on to a chemist, have different resolutions for explanations. And so all motivations are there to, to, to basically make those models Extend at the right scale and to chemists make them more actionable in the end. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing we're looking at mostly there right now is to have some kind of learnable cost training at the direction of diff pool, but there you also there you have constraint right now in that number of cost training steps, which you also would have to, to learn somewhere, be informed about in some way, trying to figure out ways to basically also learn how often you have to cost train. So, follow up. So, the, it's the one thing is, of course, the just like coming up with a seamless way of bridging between length scales and time scales. But I don't think it's also the stichiometry and composition, right? I mean, this, there's a lot of unknowns of how things actually, like what makes reactions happen, for instance. Yeah. Like maybe certain local things are that's complete, I mean, to for many systems that may be completely unknown, right? Yeah. So, just somehow has to be sort of integrated out or free to be sufficiently insignificant. <laughs> the task at hand is complicated stuff. So. Yeah, so I think if you have those unknowns, you have like two ways. I know you don't even try to understand what's going on there, which would be like the engineering like end to end approach, which just ignore all the weird things and yeah, don't care about what's happening there. If you are a scientist, you perhaps care about what's happening there. Um, and, and then I guess you can also try to look at similar systems or perhaps uh, hope that you can like cost grain those unimportant parts into some beat of something yeah. that that's, uh, like takes all the unknowns and integrates more than. I'm sure if you can talk a bit more. Um, you're very pro LMs. Thing to say? Yeah, I don't know what troll means. I mean, I think they have certain applications that are useful for what not like everything can be done. Um, in one of your slides, when you were talking, I mean, what it was called, and um, then can power neuros and bike approaches. Yeah. Like, an example where, yeah, there are more. It reminded me of this person in the SAR where they mentioned GPT 4 or various chemistry. Yeah, other scientific tasks, and they ask like quite simple or straightforward questions, and it like sometimes seem to get even just the smiles from for like a well-established compound. So I guess for aspirin is maybe most quite often in, in the training data that it has seen, so they wouldn't get it wrong. But how? I guess I'm curious how you see. 
what are the things that need to be addressed in order to to make them more uh, useful in in this case like for just where we don't have a lot of data but yeah. not like as right, but more interesting molecules um, yeah, and, but here you also rely on the LLM knowing what aspirin is. So when you think aspirin is it's like a compound, it can look up somewhere, and it goes to pop and it gets the smallest. Maybe. So it's like looking it up somewhere. So, so th Not this case, uh, what you do is you have a bunch of tools, like you have DFT simulation as a tool, you have popkin as a tool, you have RT as a tool. You just grab those tools, and then the model is prompted to basically select a tool. So you have the question as the input in the prompt and a list of tools in some form. And then the first thing is get the right tool with the right input format. Then you might make an API request to PubCare mm -hmm. that gets then from there smiles. And then with this, puts it into our kitchen consumer search, that takes this XLZ file, puts this into a DFT workflow, and then gets a result. So this the way you really have not a full control of what's happening and what is happening. So avoid these issues where like the LLM can propose you as miles that might not be the, the correct one because you're actually looking it up somewhere. Yeah, so you basically rely on the most important steps for robust tools. You can just you know, test them, you have control over them. You see what the inputs outputs were, like you see like why you have the final result. And you rely on yeah, I'm just bridging those tools. So basically, you have a lot of tools right now being developed. And so you could like build a script that you have a lot of if statements into to link those tools for different workflows. But you make them dynamic, but I think the LLM will this workflow for you on the fly. So then you mentioned, I guess, um, after this, they can, was it can bench or bench can? Yeah. Marking. Yeah. So can, can you comment a little bit more about it? I'm curious, like, what? What are the tasks that you have kind of implemented here? Yeah, so you chose the values and yeah, this So it's something we're still working on, and because right now, if you test um, LLMs, how can you test them if they get molecular net or something like this, right? Which is something you can test, but it might not tell you really if they get it right for some meaningful reasons. If they can really reason about chemistry and understand something about the concepts in there. And, and so we have been collecting uh, exam like um, questions, like from chemistry Olympiads, um, also from other university like exams, uh, and converting them into a form that can be used for LM prompting. Mm -hmm. And so all these questions are basically like, we try some reasoning, like we ask one thing we might ask is like how many peaks are we expect in the NMR spectrum of this compound? So it has to like map the smart to a graph and reason about symmetry of this graph and then answer it um, based on this. So the tests are more specific to like knowing because it's like knowing some constant has to like know so no benchmarks they're related to like how you let's say trace the point, would you get a different yeah, and so the so one part here now is having just um, the, the benchmark, like the question to answer us. And what we're currently doing is that um, Navaf, one of my students, is, is running the LMs and then also testing different ways of prompting the LMs with the answer would be and, and how different LMs perform. Yes. Um, so regarding uh, this uh, this topic and in particular the, the slide you were showing before, so the system uh, answering questions and so on, uh, how does that compare to uh, Chemco? Yeah, it's quite similar. It's the reason we didn't publish this. I mean, we had <laughs> the app first, uh, and then they had a paper in archive, and then I wasn't interested in anyone writing paper about it. Okay. <laughs> my truck's was Okay, it's quite simple. Okay, so I guess you're also using plug chain on the No. So I'm, I'm not using the lang chain anymore. But it's like a personal thing. Because lang chain builds abstraction section, then you have a lot of code that actually just hides the actual logic behind this. Because I mean, this in the end is one simple prompt, and you have then a while statement and then one for loop. Um, and lang chain gives you like a lot of load code around us and just hide what's just going on. And so I like to see what's happening. And so we just did it from scratch.
Okay, I see. Okay. But I mean, just you can oh, use sorry. the branch chain, but we have a few tricks there. Because one thing that people hide if they do stuff like this is that you have a fine context uh, size with LMs, and if you have 10 tools, and um, those might be put by description of those tools. And then you have nothing left for reasoning in this context. Oh, sure. And therefore, we have a bunch of tricks like using vector stores for tool descriptions, and we look up stuff there. And to make it more scalable, we have other feedback from other agents to, to, to see if it's still factual and sticking to the tools. So a bunch of tricks in there that make this a bit more robust. Yeah. Because quite often you see, especially if nowadays with this being a hot topic, that people just have a GIF like this one here with some stuff that looks nice on the prompts they put in there. But if you try it out yourself, it usually just breaks apart. And making those things less fragile is something that's really hard to do. It takes a lot of time, but I guess, I guess currently it's not being done that much because you have not much reward for doing this. Is the convenient. Mm -hmm. So, I was going to get a bunch of questions. So you have been learning a bunch of tools now. You said that they are sort of, especially this uh, tool for augmenting the lab. Yeah. How is this thing adopted now? I guess it was during a time at EPFL. Is, is it something that is sort of a cost for stream apps and EPFL? I mean, so what um, we are currently, so the EPFL, um, I don't know if it's currently being used, um, yeah. to be honest. Um, we also didn't roll it out production at ELN there. Um, what we're now doing is we now doing some tests and, and some other yield and develop generally and try to create there. Um, also, data that's already in there with like some post array. And to give us just kind of like vector, like um, semantic search, because right now that yield ends just have like search for certain keywords in there. And even just the first step of embedding all documents and doing semantic search would be a big benefit for most users. So start with small steps and, and then roll out more complex things. Because the, the issue is that if you have something that works nice most of the time, but then fails sometimes quite badly, for users, they will just hate <laughs> your product. And so we are quite slow in rolling those things out. I also have a question, like, I mean, for any, like, saying, like, tool formula-ish, the problem is also that the tool itself is still like, very robust, you know, like, I would say, like, saying that, like, just look up aspirin, how can you get, get out of seven matches? So I guess I have to rely on how can you know, the highest range like, the compound is actually aspirin, PDB. I, think, I guess I have to make constraints that I prefer to say maybe human proteins over any other animal and the, the highest resolution protein, maybe, and then, you know, I think, it kind of in the end, I just feel like you have to in the end, you have to break like it looks like it looks cool in the in this gifts, but I feel like as we get more specific, it becomes more and more complex for each tool because each tool itself has so many limitations, but so many oh, so it's such a complexity. Yeah, you also hear a hidden trade-off in like what you see as a tool because you can in principle just give the LM the open API description of some API. Let's try out all the routes and we'll figure out at some point what the right route is or what input if we have enough API threads uh, for the mayor. And then you have to basically balance like how much you constrain all the tool description, like if you limit just to only one route of this API, we give it full access. And, and this is something you also have to make in those tool formal things. So, so in this case here, we know that certain routes are quite often used. So we have one tool for just looking up smiles. And for us, we have the more broad tool, like get the full pubcam response and then figure it out yourself what you can um, do with that. Uh, so I think there's also a hidden trade of that we have currently no good balance for art in like human judgment of what the design there is. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. maybe you you said this um, in your presentation, but about this tool. So, did you use the the API of Open AI, or how did you? What was that? Yeah, this is another thing. Uh, we are 
having this determination trafficking because um, right, this has been using OpenAI. <laughs> we are now trying to make sort of open source LMs with like quantization and some tricks to make it work on consumer hardware to make it actually scalable on universal deployments. Um, but this then requires way more massaging, but it's worth. And because OpenAI yeah, tends to work quite well for most things out of the box, but then that you then use open source models and quite often to be a bit more massaging to make it work. Is it Lava that you're using then as the source model? Then? I mean, we now have been using Mistral and also. Yeah. One small question when you were looking at the tool with the different colors, requesting users to, to run the colors, uh, you had the one of them, and I didn't know what it was, so I looked it up, and everyone seemed not to know what it yeah. was, so that way it was all rainbow kind of color. Yeah, so, so I think for some of them, it was just like people just don't know this word. Like, I think one of them was Yonko or something. Yeah. So there's no option to say, like, I don't know what this is. Yes, so in this case, we didn't have the option. We just had this color picker, and it was opposed to pick what they what they see. Yeah. Um, but even like for for like the simpler one, uh, I mean, like the variation is still immense, and so in the end, all must be trained. Uh, and, and this data were kind of garbage. Yeah. So in the end, the navigation on the data is just so immense that you can't resolve any, any difference in there. I think it's around slide 57, maybe. I think it's this oxidation state. Yeah. 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 I think it was 50, not, I think it was 56. Like <laughs> Chemistry is very fine. No, yeah. Maybe, maybe you can just ask that for the rest of us. Yeah, it's still, it's the, so you, it was something with the, so you said that there was uh, this, uh, there was property protection, right? And there was something with the learning, had some learning curves. And you said that you were much more data efficient. It was, I think it was, it was not this one was made on, it was something where there were curves over it. So it was an adversary. Yeah. Uh, this year. Yeah, yeah what you said, Station state, that's all that. okay. so, so basically, you have this model, the green one, which is trained on tens of thousands of data points, yeah. right? Yeah, and you have the one that is fine tuned, the GPT model, which is fine yeah. tuned on something that also approaches 10,000 data points. So, so, so what is it? I wasn't sure what the exact message here was, but uh, yeah, I mean, um, so, so this here approaches also 10,000 data points, yeah, that's right. Um, but also the input here uh, is quite different. So, okay. so we give a number of structures, and each structure has like a bunch of local environments. Number of local environments is here like number of structures mark times you know, 10 or so. Right. So you have like um, 10 times number of structures, local environments. So this is already like scaled by this factor. Okay, so you have structures, and the GPC bar only sees a smile string and a pulse. Yeah. And, and so in this case, you have crystals. So you see in this case, even just composition. So this is just okay. composition here. Um, and, and this is using like full local environments. Okay. And, and, and again, I mean, this might tell you just that our baselines are kind of crap, um, especially perhaps for polymers and other things in here. Um, but even then, I mean, you can get um, all the crap crappy baselines we use nowadays yeah. uh, way more effectively. Any last questions? Let's thank uh, Kevin again.